genesis of the specific idea of island Celticness isn't coming through from history. Neither was it coming originally from archaeology, which in fact only developed as a discipline after these ideas had already become uh, entrenched in, in the popular mind. It actually comes from originally philology, from the study of languages. It derives from uh, the work of a series of brilliant scholars during the 16th and 17th centuries, notably the, the, the Scot George Buchanan, uh, the Breton Abbe uh, Paul Yves Pezeron, and it culminates in the work of the Welshman uh, Edward Hewitt or Lloyd. I don't, well, I don't think we know exactly how he pronounced his name. It would be, would be Lloyd now. Now, to vastly simplify, probably horrify any linguists in the audience, um, what Lloyd did was to add to the pioneering work of Buchanan and Pezeron in particular to demonstrate the undoubted reality, which I'm in no way disputing, and a reality which it seems was not apparent earlier to anybody, that, with the possible exception of Pictish, all the non-English languages of the Isles and Brittany were related to each other. It was not obvious before this, uh, Irish Gaelic not being mutually comprehensible with Welsh, for example. Not only that, that was uh, partly already established, he also made this, uh, helped to make this crucial link, bringing all of this together, that these languages were themselves connected with the language of the ancient Celtic Gauls. There are some fragments of that extinct language surviving, uh, of course, uh, personal names, Vercingetorix and so forth, and some short inscriptions surviving. So it's enough for, us to, for him to establish this. And to say, this is all a single family of related languages. And this was undoubtedly a major discovery. And he published this in uh, a famous and, and important a seminal book, Archaeologia Britannica, which is not actually about archaeology as we understand it now, published in the year 1707, which I think actually uh, itself is a very interesting coincidence at least. Now, what's uh, particularly intriguing is that uh, Lloyd, having identified this great family of languages, he needed a name for it. What did he opt to call it? He decided to call it the Celtic language family. And as far as I can see, and I, I've not been told I'm wrong on this by linguists, because I'm an archaeologist, this is getting right off my turf, so uh, I should have to duck down behind the lectern, I expect, later on. But anyway, um, uh, uh, yeah, he, so he opted to call it the, the, the Celtic family of languages. One of the things that strikes me as, as fascinating is that once Lloyd has, uh, had established the, the notion of Celtic speakers in the Isles, others rapidly picked up and ran with the idea, with pretty impressive speed. They broadened the term to become, for the first time here in the Isles, an ethnonym, the self-name of a people. This seems to happen after the publication of this book. And so, for example, by 1723, uh, Lloyd's friend and fellow Welshman, uh, Henry Rowlands, was writing of we the Celtai. Now, we modern Welsh can call ourselves Celts. And by the following year, it was starting to be applied as a cultural label also to the remote past, the ancestors of the modern Celts of the Isles. And so the great antiquary and father of Druidomania, William Stukeley, in 1724, was using the term Celtic of ancient monuments in the British landscape. And then during the course of the 18th century, the notion of uh, ethnic Celts in the Isles, past and present, spread through educated society. And by 1773, Samuel Johnson and uh, Boswell could encounter a clergyman in the Hebrides who believed there had been ancient Celts from Turkey to Skye. By 1817, this one I think is particularly interesting, Sir Walter Scott could in a popular novel refer to Scottish Highlanders like Rob Roy as Celts without feeling he had to explain it. He knew his audience would understand this notion of Celts in the Isles. So in just a century, the notion of island Celts had become a part of popular island history, and its actually recent origin was already generally forgotten. So if Rob Roy was a Celt, then so were earlier figures like uh, Boudicca and Caratarchus, Calgarchus and Cuchulain. And, oh, well, you know, Mel, if you want to be a, uh, a Celt, you can be a Celt as well. Uh, many of these earlier historical figures uh, were now thought of in, in Celtic terms. But how did these ancestral Celts actually come to be here? But because early peoples were supposed to have uh, special, uh, specific, unchanging characters and characteristics, this is how they were understood, they were presumed to be timeless. So any observed past cultural changes in anything from uh, language uh, to weapons or pots, these generally were explained in terms of immigration of new people. 
That was the only mechanism which, which was imagined to explain such changes. And it was generally accepted uh, by this period that the island Celts were, were here before the Romans. It was presumed they had arrived as Celtic-speaking invaders at some stage before this, replacing earlier populations. Though that's often not gone into in any specific detail. But when... Um, the prehistoric era was, by definition, beyond the direct ken of linguists or historians who relied on surviving writings. Apparent dates for these uh, Celtic invasions would come from a new 19th century discipline, which was archaeology. Now, archaeology, as I explained, was a, a latecomer to all of this, and early archaeologists went looking for Celtic invaders they already expected to be there. And the first traces from the pre-Roman centuries that they could recognise were identified because they were clearly similar to finds from France and Switzerland and Germany, which were, in the 19th century, newly ascribed to continental Celts. So in the 19th century, continental archaeologists dug up graves with classical exports in them, like this uh, Eastern French uh, chariot burial uh, with a nice Etruscan flag in him, which helps to date it to the 5th century BC. Things like this allowed them to date these finds to the times when Celtic Gauls were known to be living in these lands. This allowed us to make connections between material artefacts and these historical peoples to say, here we have the archaeology of the ancient Celtic Gauls. And uh, it allowed people to uh, identify jewellery types, sword types, and this decorative style, which seemed very characteristic, of these peoples, which became thought of as Celtic art, um, which archaeologists described as, as, as the Latin style after the type site in Switzerland where it was first described. And uh, by extension, the Latin style helps to define the wider Latin archaeological culture, this package of, uh, of archaeological traits, including things like chariot burials as well as the making of these items. And this was seen to be the material signature of the Celts. If you've got Latin culture, then you have got ethnic Celts. This was the equation that was made. So when uh, Latin items like this were being identified in Britain from about the 1850s, 1860s onwards, they were identified as Iron Age Celtic. And the, uh, the same term, therefore, starts getting applied to the first sites which we can ascribe to the Iron Age, uh, such as uh, these hill forts at Maiden Castle, for example. And of their nature, these items, being weapons, being uh, martial monuments, they seem to fit with the idea of ways of invading continental warriors. And this all helped to fix the idea that the ancestral Celts therefore arrived in the Iron Age in the last five, six, seven, eight hundred years BC. So we might see this as perhaps the capstone of the ancient Celtic arch, which we've been building since about 1700. But one of the things I found particularly interesting uh, to, to sort of reflect on is uh, why did the new idea of the island Celts initially spread so fast in the 18th century? And the answer to this, I think, is also the answer to another rather intriguing question, which is why did Edward Lloyd call the language family Celtic in the first place rather than something else? As background to this, he assumed, as was wholly right and proper and good scholarly practice at the time, uh, that uh, uh, his thinking should be based partly on biblical in inspiration, that the island languages would be descended uh, from that of the Gauls during the repeopling of the earth following the flood, because it was assumed that people had spread out from the Middle East through Europe, through Gaul, and then uh, into the Isles by migrations. So he therefore duly prioritised in his thinking what he saw as the root of this language family, the tongue of the continental Gauls. So why didn't he actually call his new uh, Celtic family, why didn't he actually call it something like Gallic or Galatic? And I think the answer is pretty clear, certainly in my opinion, that the answer is politics. Because people in this room will be uh, familiar enough with the political dynamics of the late 1600s and the early 1700s when Lloyd was actually working on this scholarly research. It was a time when the double kingdom of England, Wales and Scotland was in confrontation with the France of Louis XIV. It was under a Protestant establishment terrified both of French power and of the Catholicism of France and of the exiled Stuart House. And the outcome of this uh, political, extended political crisis was the Union of 1707, creating the United Kingdom of Great Britain. 
Fear of Jacobite and French plotting was rife at this period. And France was already identified with the ancient Gauls. It was effectively politically impossible at the time for Lloyd to call this newly identified, newly discovered language family anything relating to the word Gallic. But Celtic didn't have the same baggage. And it was taken up so quickly, I think, because the union and the rise of the new Anglo-centric superstate intensified the sense of threat perceived to other non-English identities in the Isles. And this discovery of a common linguistic heritage and then the, the, the devising of notion of pre-Roman origins gave the non-English peoples a claim to priority over the upstart post-Roman uh, Arivista, the Anglo-Saxons. It gave them also a sense of collective identity distinct from increasingly powerful and dominant England. And this sense of commonality needed a name. Now, the ancient term British had now been hijacked by the new superstate. The advantage of, of the term Celtic was that it embraced even deeper European roots. And it could also include the Irish. This was something, of course, that the Britishness couldn't. And further, it actually then proved quite convenient for English supremacists who were happy for others to be Celts in contrast to English Teutons and uh, uh, racist uh, comparisons were made on, on that basis, particularly in the Victorian period.